Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When my family was in Glacier Mountain National Park, some of the most beautiful and pristine sites were places you had to hike to. Now, there's plenty of scenery you could drive to, beautiful sites like the one here. However, if you were willing to hike even just a mile or two, you could take it to a whole new level. And some of the most beautiful views can only be reached through narrow hiking trails. You know, there is no way a vehicle could make it up some of those inclines, and it would have been not very practical, certainly not cost-effective or easy to try to make roads through much of the park. So you had to hike. And to varying degrees, sometimes you had to climb or scramble as well. Well, this was hardly the best example that I we encountered, but it was one of the few pictures I took where there was a moderately narrow path. And even so, this path is relatively narrow, certainly couldn't drive a vehicle down it. And there were some trails that were even more so. You could only go up one at a time and you had to stop and wait if someone was coming down while you were going up. There was even a couple of trails where part of our party went up and some didn't go all the way. Now hiking along narrow paths is really pretty similar to what Jesus says we will face if we follow him. Jesus tells us today to strive to enter through the narrow door because we will probably miss it if we don't strive. Part of the reason I like hiking is because of that challenging aspect to it. Plus, I enjoy the beautiful scenery that God's creation offers and it's, um, it's worth it when you get to some beautiful sights. And following Jesus is a lot more like hiking a mountain trail, say, than taking a walk around the block. Jesus tells us it's narrow. And that means following Jesus isn't always easy. Sometimes it means pushing ourselves to focus on Jesus when we're tired or frustrated or worn down. It takes effort to avoid the easy path of instant gratification, especially when life is moving along smoothly. On the other hand, it's hard to avoid despair or bitterness when our lives are lonely or painful. At times like these, Jesus encourages us, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and not be able. Now, that doesn't exactly sound like a lazy Sunday afternoon. And nor is Jesus telling us, just believe the right things. Make sure you know about me, and that's enough. No, Jesus is telling us to push ourselves in our spiritual walk with Christ. Now, the Greek word that's used here describes competing. It's used to talk about struggling or even fighting. According to Oxford, strive, which I'd say is a really good fit, means to make efforts, to great efforts to achieve or obtain something, or to struggle or fight vigorously. Faith means striving. Jesus continues to use doors when describing God's presence, and then he shifts a little bit. This second part, the second door Jesus describes, is not merely narrow. The door is shut. Now, I think this story sounds harsh to our ears, but if you just think about it, it really is not that harsh. It makes sense. I mean, would you let just anyone into your home after locking the door at night? How would you respond to someone pounding at your door at, say, 10 or 11 p.m.? There's probably some people you would let in. <laughs> I think there's also some people you wouldn't let in, people you 
didn't trust or people who you didn't trust with your family. If you don't strive to enter the narrow door, Jesus says one day it will be shut. Remember that Jesus is answering a question here. The question is, someone asked him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And Jesus' answer, typical, is not really a straightforward yes or no. It's instead, he forces us to consider this more closely. But one thing that is crystal clear is that not everyone who assumes that they are part of God's people will actually be allowed in. Just thinking you're okay, just thinking you're in God's graces, doesn't make it so. In fact, the homeowner calls these who say, we know you, we heard you in the streets, we saw you. He calls them workers of evil. Now, this parable, this particular parable, doesn't really address why they aren't let in. It simply, the point is simple, not everyone will be let in. To understand why people aren't allowed in, we need really the rest of Luke chapter 13 or context. And at the beginning of this chapter, Jesus addresses what was the headline news in Jerusalem at the time. Not pleasant, as much news isn't. Pilate had killed some rebels and mingled their Jewish blood into pagan sacrifices to make a point. Don't cross me. But Jesus says, despite their horrible demise, he says, these people are no worse than you. In fact, your fate will be worse if you don't repent. And Jesus followed this up by telling a parable about a fig tree in a garden. God is patient, but there comes a time when a tree that doesn't bear fruit will be cut down. Now again, Jesus uses this example because it just makes sense. It's peach season, I, and I love a good peach, especially if you can get them fresh, not just shipped. But growing a peach uh, is a lot of work. I don't know that much about it, but my wife's family, extended some of her extended families in Michigan, and so I learned a little more after I married her. And no one would want to spend all those years cultivating a tree, waiting it for it to, to be big enough to produce fruit, and then fighting off pests and other predators no one would want to go through all of that, a fair amount of work, if there weren't going to be peaches at the end, right? You plant a peach tree so you get peaches.